All right, praise the Lord. That's enough. <laughs> Listen, I am excited about the message today. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1? Hit me. Yes, sir. Second Peter chapter 1, and we're going to uh, get into the Word of God this morning. We'll do it after service, Jacob. I've got two messages. And I was just seeking the Lord about this. And we're going to finish them tonight. If you can be back with us at 5 o'clock. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that obtain like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power is given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This morning I want to speak to you about exceeding great and precious promises. Will you pray with me and pray for me as we get into the Word? Father, we thank you for your presence once again today. Lord, as we come to Your Word, we ask that You would anoint the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of it. God, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and a heart prepared to receive it like good seed on good soil, that it might bear fruit in our lives. Speak to us today. God, I do ask that You would say words that men are not able to say, that Your people, that Your church might be edified. In Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Simon Peter, writing this epistle, he was just a common fisherman when Jesus met him, but he became a great fisher of men. He became an apostle of Jesus Christ and a real pioneer when Christianity was very early. He was there making a path raising up churches and encouraging believers. By the time you come to this second epistle, Peter is expecting to die very soon. He knows that he's going on with the Lord. He was a young man when he began to follow Jesus, but now he's an old man. Jesus prophesied that over him. That when you're young, you'll go where you want to go, but when you get old, you'll be led by the hand by other people. And as he knows his days are numbered, his concern is the church of Jesus Christ. Because he knows, listen, anything that you do for God, it's bigger than you are. And, and you, you, you don't build it on the foundation of men. I, I could leave this world before I finish this message this morning. I, I have no idea how many days that I'm allotted on this earth. But Calvary Chapel shouldn't die, should I die. It should live on. It should grow on. It should be carried by other people that are seeking this same God. And, and you want that. You want, I want it to go from generation to generation and, and and, and see, you got more to say about that in a moment, but to see my children go further after God than I ever dreamed about going. So that's Peter's concern with the church. And he's concerned about apostasy. Apostasy means to abandon a previous loyalty. You were loyal to Jesus. You were loyal to His teaching and to His doctrine. But things come along. Situations, other influences come and it causes people to turn Turn away from that. Peter is concerned with the great falling away and deception that would plague and attack the body of Christ. All of these great men dealt with that. Paul, Peter, others, 
But the answer to the deception, the answer to whatever the problem was, God's answer was to always bring Jesus Christ back into view. Whatever the problem, whatever the dilemma, I can tell you the answer for me and you, church, is to get another look at Jesus. See Him again. When you come to make decisions in your life, when you come to make choices in your life, what has this got to do with the will of God for me? What has this got to do with the Word of God? And I'm so thankful for those who through the centuries and through the, through the years have kept the faith and stayed the course. You understand that's why we have it today. That's, that's why all through here is copies of the words of the living God because somebody put their life at risk so that you could have it. People died so that we could have it. People have died to defend the faith and to preach the gospel. Peter introduces himself in the first verse of the first chapter as a servant and an apostle. Servant comes first. It's amazing the way that he identified as that. He didn't say, you know, I'm the man that Jesus found on the shores and I was always first in line following Him. I was the one that preached that great message on the day of Pentecost. I'm a servant. What's a servant mean? It means your will is swallowed up in the will of another. When you give your life to Jesus, that means you lose your rights to it. That means you're telling Him, you're making Him Savior and Lord of your life. If He's Lord, that means I'll do what you say. I'll go where you tell me to go. I'll stay where you tell me to say. I want your will to be done. Even if it costs me my hopes and my plans and my dreams. And what I thought was best for me, I'll do your will. Peter said, I am a servant. You never outgrow that time. You might be the first apostle of a mega church, but you'll never outgrow that title of being a servant of the Lord. He says, I'm a servant and I'm an apostle. The word apostle, it means to be sent. They were sent to difficult regions. You know, we live in a day where you just put that in your name on Facebook. It costs nothing to do that. These men went to great places, dangerous places. They were sent and commissioned by God to do a work for His kingdom. He writes to those, he says, unto them who have obtained like precious faith. I wanted to make this point this morning that faith is not bought or earned. Faith is obtained. The word obtained means it is divinely received. If you have faith operating in your heart today, that was God's gift. That was God's gift and His deposit on the inside of you as a result of God's righteousness that was displayed at Calvary's cross. He's writing to people that have obtained like precious faith according to the righteousness of of God. God's righteousness means you are brought into a right standing with God. God clothes you with His righteousness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made Jesus to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It's important for you to understand that righteousness is not you going out and doing a bunch of right things. You can never earn God's righteousness. God's righteousness is a gift. Paul wrote in Romans 3.22 that God's righteousness is given to and placed upon all them that believe. The moment that you display faith in God's Son and what He did at the cross, God gives you as a gift His righteousness. That means you're not a lost sinner anymore. You're not a child of the devil. You're not on your way to hell. You're not dead in your sin. You are brought into right relationship with God as a result of this righteousness. Faith is God's gift that comes to us as a result of God's righteousness. Faith comes. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17 that faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes 
by the Word of God. It, it's so important that you choose your friends wisely. Because you want to be around people that build up your faith with the Word of God. People that will encourage you. People that will tell you you're wrong when you're wrong. People that will lift you up when you're down. People that help you build faith. You remember those boys who found their friend couldn't walk and the, the house was too crowded and they couldn't get to Jesus. But thank God he had friends who had faith and they lifted him up on the roof and tore the shingles off and lowered him right in front of Jesus and Jesus liked what he saw when he saw their faith he said get up and walk your sins are forgiven you God gives us a measure of faith the Bible says that he has given unto every man a measure of faith and as you operate in that faith it will grow and it will increase faith Peter says it's precious the word precious, it means it has great rank, value, and honor. Like precious faith means that our faith is of equal value. You know, it takes the same faith to save a drug addict as it does to save an apostle. It's the same faith. Our faith is equal. Our faith is needed. This is why it's important, y'all, for all of us to be engaged when we come into this house to worship God. Because you've got a measure. I wouldn't think for a minute that I've got everything that God needs to, to work in this house. But you know what? I do have a measure. And that's all I desire to do is Sunday, Wednesday, pour my measure in. And if you'll pour your measure in, there will be enough to go around in this house. God gives you that measure to use it, to pour it in so that the fullness of Jesus might be seen in this place. God gave you a measure of faith. Let it operate. Let it operate at the house. If you're sitting on five gallon buckets praying with your kids, that same God that meets you in this altar, He'll meet you at the house. He'll meet you at work. Lay your hands on your co- Preach the gospel to your co-worker at your school. That same faith, it's like and it's precious. It's of equal value. You could take the, the whoever your favorite greatest preacher is. I can tell you the same faith that operates in that man is the faith that operates in every child of God. You have to exercise it. It's precious, but listen to me. What makes faith precious and valuable and powerful is the object that you put it in. People have faith in all kinds of things. People have faith in good luck charms. They have faith in other people. But faith is only as good as the object that you put it in. Don't put your faith in silver and gold. Don't put your faith in your job or in the economy. Don't put your faith in Democrats or Republicans. Put your faith in the Son of the living God who bled and died for you, was buried, and three days later He walked out of that tomb. Today He sits at the Father's right hand. Soon He's coming back. That's, where you're, that's what makes your faith powerful and, and valuable. That's what makes it a faith that God recognizes and honors. Not faith in your words. Not faith in whether you're an apostle or a preacher or a worship leader or how much you go to church or who your grandfather was. None of it makes faith legitimate. Faith in Christ. Faith in Christ and Him crucified. That's what makes our faith alike. That means we believe the same thing. We put it in the same place. And it's precious. Not because it's in our works, but in God's work and in God's grace. Peter used the word precious several times. You know, that's a word men probably don't use that much. But Peter used it a lot. When he says something's precious, he means it has great value. It has great worth. It holds great rank in my life. My faith is precious to me. He said in 1 Peter 1 and verse 7, He said the trying of your faith 
is more precious than silver and gold that perishes. That means if you're going through something difficult today, you better know that is precious. Because what's going to happen to you is you're going to come out on the other side of it with a testimony of power, with a testimony of strength. David said, I was bound in miry clay and I cried unto the Lord and He heard me. He pulled me out. He set me upon a solid rock and a new song in my mouth. And He said, many shall hear it and be turned unto the Lord. The trying of your faith is precious. It has great value. I can tell you a lot of people love Jesus on Sunday morning. But a lot of that love's gone by Monday. A lot of people love Jesus on Easter. But you can't find Him any other day of the week. It's because a lot of times faith is superficial. It doesn't cost anything to say that you have faith. Or... But if God has put faith in your heart... That faith is going to be tried and it's going to be tested because God wants it to be mature. The trying of your faith is precious. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, unto you that believe, Jesus is precious. You know, to a lot of people, Jesus is just a cuss word, a byword, a slur. But if you're a true believer in Him, If He found you when you were low and broken, desperate and empty, and you called upon His name and He came to you, unto you that believe, Jesus is precious. I remember when Jesus became precious at at our house. I can remember not even being able to pray over a ham sandwich at the table in our trailer house without crying like a baby. Jesus became precious to me. Of great worth and value. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19 that you weren't redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus. Peter said that blood is precious. It has great rank and great value. And here we read in chapter 1 and verse 4 that we were given exceedingly great and precious promises. God's promises to your life are of great rank and great value. The Bible says in verse 3 that it's according to His divine power that God has given us all these things. The word divine power in the Greek is the word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite. I really like this word. It's explosive power. It's God's miracle working power. It's God's power to save a lost soul. It's God's power to forgive sin. It's God's power to heal sick bodies. It's God's power to deliver addicts and drunks and homosexuals and anything that plagues this world. God's power is explosive to set the captive free. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18 that the preaching of the cross is the power. Same word. The preaching of the cross. The message of the cross. It is the power of God. Because on that cross, God's power was displayed. That He took your sin and your filth and put it on His own Son. That He might take His righteousness and put it on you and forgive you for all time. That is God's power. And the Bible says that it's through that power we have been given all things. Tell your neighbor all things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Peter says it's all found in the knowledge of Jesus. I was singing that song, Miss Billy. It's, it was it wonderful words of life. Is there a song? Sing them over again to me. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Those are the words of Jesus. That's the Word of God. Everything that you need for life and godliness, it's found in the knowledge of Him. Does it matter if you're seeking marriage or a family? You better make sure that Jesus is at the center of that thing or it's never going to work out. 
if you're seeking a career or wealth. You know, there, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong, young people, with wanting to have a good job and to do well for yourself. I want to do good for my family and I want to make them proud. But you better make sure at the foundation of it, it's built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ or it will all come crashing down on top of you ministry and revival. You know, it's not wrong. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, covet earnestly the best gift. It's nothing wrong with eagerly desiring the best things of God to operate in your life and in your church. But you better make sure at the midst, at the core of it, that Jesus Christ Himself is the foundation and the chief cornerstone of everything that's built in your house, in, in God's house, and in your life. Everything for life and godliness. That word life, it's the same word that Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundant. He didn't say, well, boys, i come to help you get by. <laughs> I come to help you. Well, how are you doing, man? I'm just barely making it. But you come to church with me. We're all just barely making it. Well, I've come that you might have life. And life more abundant. Get to know Jesus. And you're going to start seeing life spring up around you. You'll see depression leave. You'll see wounds that have been on your heart and kept you in a prison ever since you were a little kid. God will begin to heal them wounds and turn it into life and turn it into a testimony. Everything that you need for life and godliness. That means sanctification. How are you going to live a life that pleases God? It's all found, Peter says, in the knowledge of Him that has called you unto glory And virtue. The Bible says in verse 4 that it's through that power we are given exceedingly great and precious promises. How many of you would say God's made promises to me over my life? I know that He has. And there are times, those, though that's the trying of your faith, there are times that promise will seem a long way off. But it's in those moments you've got to hold it as precious. Let me tell you something. If God said He was going to do it for you, it will come to pass. Don't you let go of it. The devil will come and try to hinder you. Your feelings will come and they, they will lie to you. But if God promised it to you, it shall come to pass. You know, I was just like John was saying, I, I, was, I was thinking on this about when I first got saved, the biggest thing that my, in my prayers was I was praying for my family I was praying for my marriage I was praying for my for my boys I didn't have a little girl back in those days but I was I was praying for my boys and one of the things that I, I had asthma when I was a kid I, I was sick all the time I it turned into a cold and before you know it, uh, several times I'd get put in the hospital with pneumonia. My daddy'd come and spend the night with me in the hospital. I remember he was sleeping on a chair in the hospital one night, talking about how bad it was. I said, "I said, won't you just come get up here in this bed with me?" And that's what he did. And the nurses came in there the next morning. My daddy was in the bed with me at the hospital. I was a little boy. I had all them tubes running to me. I was sick all the time, and and uh, just lived on Dimetap uh, and. Robitussin. Anybody know what that is? And uh, man, just cough and couldn't get well. I had an inhaler when I was a kid and couldn't ever could run very far. And I remember praying for my boys when they were little. I didn't want them to have asthma. I wanted God to make them healthy and I wanted God to make them strong. Well, just last week we took Carter to this little track beside the Votec to see if he could run a mile. Going to try to run track or whatever it is they got next year. And I I knew I couldn't run a mile, but I believed he could. Amen, somebody. Somebody told him how long it was to go. And that boy ran a solid mile across that track in about eight minutes last week. Ain't got a lick of asthma. None of my children have got it. God's promises are good. And God is faithful. Earlier this year in school, we had graduations. Had one graduate sixth grade. 
One graduated third grade and one graduated kindergarten. And earlier in the school year, teacher pulled Lauren aside and said she ain't catching on. She ain't making it. And we're going to put her in a special group and probably going to have to do this again next year. And man, I just started praying. And I felt the enemy put it in my mind. Something wrong with that girl. You know, they, they never had trouble. She's having trouble, and I just started praying. And I just begin to say back, ain't a thing wrong with that girl. Not one thing's wrong with that girl. And I'm, I'm praying into that, and then I realized the reason she didn't know her ABCs was because we just treat her like a princess, and she ain't concerned about no ABCs. But as she got to being there in school and, and got, got, to, got to learn and, and, and um, did fine in school, those grades improved. We're going to first grade next year. Amen. And I just know... God's blessing and God's promises. You hear a lot about generational curses. Folks, why don't we step up and start believing God for generational blessings that it will go from faith to faith, glory to glory, from generation to generation. There will be no curses in my house. But there will be the blessing of the Lord. I remember when I first got saved, I found Psalms 112. And I wrote it down on a yellow piece of paper. And I used to carry it in my pocket. And I'd I'd pull it out and read it. And I turned it into a prayer. God, the Bible says, Blessed is the man that fears the Lord and delights in His commandments. His seed shall be mighty in in the earth. And the Lord will bless the generations of the upright. Stand on God's promises, church. That's all I'm saying to you this morning. The devil will try to hinder you and corrupt those promises and discourage you. But you've got to stand up straight, child of God. And know that God has given you exceedingly great and precious promises, and His power is behind His promises. According to His divine power, He made you those promises. If God said you're going to get healed, you're going to get well. I thought about Miss Billy this morning. I didn't know you'd be here, but I thought about you. Is that Psalms 118 that you like to quote? You'll live and not die. And declare the works of the Lord. She fell down this week. Bruised her up good. Nothing was broken. By the grace of God, she waltzed right in here this morning. (laughs) Hallelujah. If God told you He was going to save your family, you need to stand on it. And you need to pray into it. Because they're coming in. If God said He was going to give you a ministry, you need to stand on it. You need to believe God for it. And doors will open. You have to believe His Word because His power is behind His promises. Peter goes on to say in this fourth verse that by this power and by these promises, we are made partakers of the divine nature. Say that with me. Divine nature. The divine nature is the new nature that comes when you're born again. How many of you know when you met Jesus, there was a change in your life? That's that new nature coming to live on the inside of you. It changes your appetites. That means you don't want the things that you used to want anymore. And now you find yourself desiring things that you used to not care anything about. It it changes your desires that you don't want to go there and do that anymore. But but instead, you you, you want to seek the things of God. You want to be around different people. One man explained it this way. If you could imagine a hog in slop and he's just right at home. Man, the dirtier, the stinkier, the rottener, the better. He's in hog heaven. If you imagine that hog in an instant turning into a five-year-old little girl standing in that field, standing in that slop. She's going to start screaming, Somebody get me out of here. Why? Because she doesn't belong there. Neither do you, child of God. You don't belong in sin. You don't belong in filth. You don't belong in that world. Through these promises, through the knowledge of Christ and His divine power, you have been made a partaker 
A recipient of God's divine nature. And it's through that nature, the inner working of the Spirit in you, that you escape the corruption and the lust that's in that world. It's God that works in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. That's how people change. God changes them. That's how people put those drugs down. They put that alcohol down. They put that pornography down. And they don't pick it up again. Why? Because God gave them a new nature. And He works on the inside of them to sanctify that life and to make it holy. Paul says it another way in Ephesians 4. If you could go there with me. It's wonderful. Ephesians 4 and verse 22 It says, and you put off concerning the former conversation. The word conversation, the King James, means your lifestyle. The way you live. The Bible doesn't teach you get saved and keep living that same old life. It says you put off that former life. The old man. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed. Everybody say renewed. That means to be restored into your right condition. Listen to me. Ever how old you were when you met Jesus, that's how long your mind, your spirit, your soul was perverted by the world. You heard things. You did things. You put things into your body. You watched things that put images into your mind. And the enemy began to build strongholds in your life. And it's through those strongholds he desires to destroy you. The Bible says that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. God begins to teach you now how to think. I I had a friend who used to tell me that from a kid, they just grew up around pornography and images like that. It was in their house growing up. They saw it all the time. And this man was saved and he was filled with the spirit. And he loved Jesus, but he used to tell me, I can't get these images out of my mind. And I'd say, stay in the presence of God. Keep looking to Jesus, keep coming to church and being in His Word and God will wash your mind and give you a new mind. He told me the other day, He said, hardly any of those old thoughts come up into my mind anymore. It's the renewing of the mind. God restoring it to the way it ought to be. That's what God does. God will renew that mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, and that you put on The new man. Everybody say new man. man. To put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So the exhortation is simple. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. The old man is that man was controlled by the sin nature. Say that with me. Sin nature. Sin nature is the nature you got in the fall. Sin nature, the best way to explain that, parents, is you don't have to teach a child to do what's wrong. They'll give you gray hairs trying to teach them how to do what's right. Because you got that sin nature in the fall. Every one of us did. We were born bent and broken. We were born selfish. We inherited that, man. I did all kinds of stupid things in my old life and nobody ever put a gun to my head to do it. I wanted to do it. It's like smoking cigarettes. I've used this before. You never smoked the first one and said, boy, that tastes good. You never took the first drink of Jack Daniels and said, man, I like the way that feels. No, it burns and you cough and it hurts. But something wrong with us. We'll just keep doing it and doing it and doing it until we can't live without it. That's insane. Sin is insanity. And it's in that old nature. And it don't matter how you cologne him or perfume him or dress him up. He's still that pig in the slop. What's the answer? That man's got to get a new nature. He must be born again. He must see Jesus. And Christ must be made alive in his heart. We spend our lives lost and empty looking for answers and we try to fill it with things that we think will help us. But it only ends up creating more problems. Jesus is the answer. Romans 5.19 By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. 
Because of what Adam did, we all had that curse on us. But by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. That is God's answer. To pull you out of Adam and to place you into the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me, I will abide in you and you shall bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. It's through union with Christ. Being joined with Christ in His death, in His burial, in His resurrection. That that new life comes. Christ triumphed over Adam. Just like Jesus can triumph over every mistake you've made in your life. How many of you would agree Adam made a big blunder that day? Messed us all up. Me and Lauren was out hacking in that garden a couple weeks ago. and She said, darn you, Adam. <laughs> I said, I'm going to wash that mouth out with soap. No, I'm kidding. I can tell you, we can look around a lot deeper than that and see the effects of it. It's what we all have in common in this room. You've all felt the pain that sin brings. But Christ triumphed. What He did was greater than what Adam did. What God has done for you is greater than what anybody could ever do to you in this world. You just have to receive it. Grace triumphed over sin. And by simple faith in God's Son, your life and your nature is changed forever. As God makes promises to you, they're brought on trial. (laughs) We talked some through the weekend with Brother Brian McDonald. I'm reminded of it all the time. I half-heartedly wanted to pull into the community center this morning. Because sometimes when God's doing something in your life, you can't see it in that season. You just can't wait to get out of here and go to the next season because I don't like this one. It's painful and it's hard. But if you can stop and notice the fingerprint of God in your life, you know what those times were? They were precious to me. Because there might not have been a lot on the outside that people could have seen and recognized. A lot was happening inside of here. We were over there and across from that post office. And, you know, you, you just could have put everybody in, in one corner. Little old bitty thing. Little old bitty place. God was, those times were precious. God was helping us. God was making us worshipers. God was teaching us to get into the altar and pray. Testimonies were coming forth. God was teaching us His Word. And when God makes promises to you, you have to hold on to them. Whether you're believing God for your body to be healed, whether you're believing God for your family to come in, some of you, your family is coming in. Rejoice in that because that just adds to the testimony and the resume that God does answer prayer. Some ministry is growing. You're growing in what God's calling you to do. You know, seeing these, these young people. I can remember, I can remember years ago, I'd give an altar call and about all I could get to come was Logan. He'd come down and pray and, you know, but now, just like this afternoon, we're going to take these kids. They'll be preaching in that nursing home. You know, every time I see that, that's God's promise to me. I remember when they were very little, I was praying Psalms 112 over my family. And I know that God heard me. Has God made promises to you? Think about it for a moment. What are you believing God for? God says those promises are precious. Hold on to them. God says that those promises are backed by His divine power. Not for you to go figure out how to do it, but for you to believe that God can... And God will do it. God says that it's through those promises, through that power, you've been made the partaker of a brand new nature. It's just like these giant oak trees that are out across the road. You know, everything that it took to make that giant tree what it is was one time found in a little bitty acorn. Just a little bit. That's why the Bible says that it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
The only hope that I have of seeing glory, the only hope I have of Christ being glorified in my life is that He works on the inside of me. Sometimes His sanctification in our life is just like that. You put it down and you don't see that again. Other times there will be a fight. There will be a war in your heart and in your life. You keep your eyes on Jesus. You keep believing. That blood is precious and don't let anybody tell. His promises are precious. God's promise to you is that sin won't reign over your life. Because you're not under law. You're under grace. Listen to me. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I want to ask you today, church, what are you believing God for in your life? And have you let the enemy rob you of the promises that God made to you? I pray today that you'd let them be resurrected. Because they don't have a shelf life or an expiration date on it. If God said He's going to do it, He's going to do it. It does call, pray into it. Believe God. I don't mind telling people what I believe God's going to do in my life. It's just an expression of faith in what He's going to do. And then it comes a time where you have to stand on it because His promises are always backed by His power. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we thank You. Lord, for Your Word, and we thank You for Your testimony. God, we thank You for the Apostle Peter. and God, this Word that it outlives him. He saw Your promises come through in his life. You told him, Peter, if you follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And God, through all that, there was one day when he preached a short little old sermon and 3,000 souls were born into the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank You that Your promises are good. We thank You that Your promises are valid. Lord, I pray all across this room this morning, Lord, that those promises would be recognized, that they would be resurrected. Lord, there are some here today that are praying for their body to be healed, for their loved ones to be healed. God, if You told them You would do that, God, then we stand on the promise in faith that you will. Lord, there are those here today that are believing for their family to come to Christ. They've got parents or grandparents. They've got a spouse. They've got children or grandchildren that are away from God. And Lord, we pray today. Lord, just like you told that Philippian jailer, God will save you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and God will save you in your whole house. One moment that man from, went from wanting to die, wanting to take his own life, seeing his whole family come to Jesus in a moment. Lord, let those promises be resurrected here today. God, we thank You that behind those promises is Your divine power. Lord, we recognize that we can't save anybody. We can't heal anybody. None of it's on us. But Lord, we put it all on You today. You're the Savior. You're the healer. Lord, Your Word says that You're a healer of broken heart. You bind up all their wounds. Lord, I pray that promise would become a reality in this house today. Lord, that what You pour into us wouldn't keep leaking out through cracks and wounds and hurt places. Lord, that we would be mended, held together by Your love, by Your grace, by Your power. Hold on to those promises. Lord, I pray for young people in this room this morning that are looking looking ahead at life and they've got excitement. Lord, they've got careers. They've got school. Some have got marriage coming up. Lord, let those lives be built on the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Lord, let their life be lived where it doesn't result in regret, saying, I wish I'd have listened I wish I'd have done the right thing. But Lord, that they would put you before them. And they would build their house on the solid rock of who Jesus is and the words that He spoke. 
so that when storms come through, we don't come crashing down. Lord, we ask You, God, for generational blessing to be bestowed and poured out upon this house today, God. Lord, that from fathers to sons to grandchildren, that the blessing of the Lord would be in their house, God. Lord, just as you would say, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, build that testimony in this house. That we will walk with you. Our children will walk with you. And their children after them will walk with you. Lord, build your testimony in this house. Thank you for working. Touch us in this altar. Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, just confess those promises. If God's made them to you, just confess them back to Him this morning. Lord, I remember when you told me. I believe that you're going to do it. Pray His blessing on your family and those people that you love. Lord, even though we haven't seen it yet, God, we believe that it is coming. Lord, let our faith be encouraged. Oh, Jesus, You said that faith is precious. The trying of it is more precious than silver and gold that perishes. Oh, child of God, it might look like things are going from bad to worse in your life. Why don't you realize God's trying and testing that faith that's in your heart. Just hold on and believe Him. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. They're according to Your divine power. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank You, my God. Thank You, my God. Could the rest of us just lift your hands with me this morning? Just magnify the Lord. God, we thank You for Your promises. Isn't it amazing that God speaks to people? God called Abraham to come out of that place of idol worship and darkness. He said, I'm going to make you a blessing everywhere that you go. That's what God's doing. He's making us a blessing in this lost and dying world. Bring the gospel message of Jesus Christ. I believe Adam's Avenue is blessed to have a Spirit-filled church right here on the side of this road. I believe you poor of Mississippi and Webster County are blessed that God has a people praying for the harvest to come in. I believe your family is blessed to have you in it, even though they might make fun of you and they may not like you or want you around. If you're lifting up their name in the presence of God, they are blessed beyond words to have you there. And I believe you're going to see the day that one by one, they're going to want to know this same Jesus that you know this same Jesus that you love. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. While we're here in the altar, I do want to ask Jacob to come. Jacob graduated high school Friday night. We're so proud of him. If you're still praying, please stay right where you are. Don't feel rushed to move or to leave. Church, I want us to gather around Jacob. We're going to pray for him before we go this morning. Proud of you. I know God has great things for you. Stay in that altar, Jacob. Stay close to Jesus. Got this for you. You've got the church to sign it. We're just going to pray. God's going to bless you, lead you wherever you go. Let him be your foundation. All right. Would you lift your hands? Come on, guys. Let's gather around him. We're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, let Your Spirit come upon Jacob this morning and go with him all the days of his life. God, we pray that You would cause Your face to shine upon him and his enemies would be scattered. Lord, illuminate the path that You would have him to walk, God. 
Lord, may he walk in your will. May he walk in your wisdom. May he walk in your word, God. Lord, that you keep him close. You be his shepherd that leads him and guides him and protects him from evil and from harm. God, help him to make wise decisions. Lord, I pray that you would surround him with the right people, surround him with friends that would encourage him and encourage his faith. God, we pray that you would remove from him the wrong people, negative influences and negative voices. And God, that you would build your testimony in his life. God, bless him, spirit, soul, and body. Lord, may He prosper as His soul prospers. Lord, we believe that You have great things for this young man. Bless him at college. Lord, bless him traveling and going to and fro. Protect him and keep him. God, I pray that You would speak to him. Speak to him in his bed at night. God, with dreams and vision. Lord, be in his thoughts while he is awake. God. Lord, that you would lead him and guide him in all that he does. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Can we give the Lord a hand this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.